I'm glad and honored to open the sessions that I'm chairing as well about peace and democracy in Kurdistan. Thank you for inviting me to Stockholm. Thank you, Mr. Alan Dilani, professor, for inviting me to Kurdistan last year after studying the Kurds for 20 to 25 years in archives and university libraries and interviewing people, I was able to see Kurdistan for myself. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. My speech does not contain any advice or any suggestions. I believe that the Kurds are proud people, smart people, and they are smart enough to draw their own conclusion from the political, historical situation. I became involved in Kurdistan in a very peculiar way. I was a student at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem when I was studying the economy of the Middle East, and I had to write a paper. So I thought maybe I would ask to write a paper about the economy of Kurdistan, and my professor said, fine. Then I realized that there are hardly any written materials, hardly any documents, not in Hebrew, hardly in Arabic, or in other languages. So I had to interview people, only for this paper term alone, about the economy of Zaho, where my father came from, I interviewed 12 people. And this fantastic mechanism and experience of interviewing elderly Kurdish Jews really fascinated me and drew me into the subject because I interviewed people not like me, who sometimes doesn't remember the telephone number at home or my wife or the children, but these people, these Kurdish people, these Jewish Kurds who lived in, in Israel, but they were 50 years before, 60 years they lived in Kurdistan, they lived in an oral culture where their memory was fascinating. They could remember everything they did. They spoke four, five, six languages. They knew the map of Kurdistan by heart because they traveled on donkeys or mules. And they knew all the villages, all the Aras, all the history of Kurdistan because they lived it. And I had privilege to interview throughout my studies, throughout my six, PhD, 66 Jews from Kurdistan. And I didn't interview them once, not twice, not three times, not four times, five and six and seven. Once, <coughs> when I interviewed someone from Shino, I came to him at the eight times, Mr. Mikhaeli, and he said, Mordechai, or Moti, Everything I told you, that's it. I have nothing left to tell you. He took a pocket out of his, turned them out and told me I have nothing left to tell you. I told you all my history. So it was fascinating. This is how I became aware and became familiarized with the tribal history of Kurdistan, which the Kurdish people forgot because they were busy fighting they were busy with their struggle. They were being oppressed. They had so many economical, social, military problems. And the Assyrians also were dispersed. So the only way, the only people who kept the memory of Kurdistan are the people of the Jewish Kurds from, Israel, from Kurdistan who immigrated to Israel and continued to wear Shale Shapek and Jamadani and eat Kurdish food and listen to Hamo and Hasso Jizrawi and Isa Barwari every day of their life. They kept the Kurdish 
the tradition of Kurdistan alive. And in the neighborhood I lived, they spoke Aramaic and some Kurdish, but there were the daily words were Kurdish, Jiran, Dujmin, Drangi, Hedi Hedi, Bash. The whole culture was Kurdish culture. And these people left Kurdistan, but Kurdistan did not leave them. So I became interested and I did research. And I will tell you some of the fascinating stories about some of the informants I had to explain the special relationship between the Kurds and the Jews. For example, I'm sure you are not aware of, maybe some of you know, Sheikh Mohammed Rabatke from Iraqi Kurdistan. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, Sheikh Mohammed Rabatke, the British intelligence report didn't think highly of him. I, I, I looked at the intelligence report of uh, British military intelligence. They thought he was a pity chieftain, not so important, not so influential. But when I interviewed the Jewish subjects of his village, they admired him. And not only one person, several persons, because I did the cross-examination of all the stories. They told me stories that indicate a little bit. For example, one day, one of my informant, Moshe Mizrahi from Jerusalem, whom I met his, in his 90s, told me that during the 30s, 1930s, they were going to go from Kurdistan to Israel. And they lived in Rabatke. They put all their goods, all the stuff of their house, and they went to another village called Spindare to sell the goods because they want, they want to immigrate to Palestine. They went there, they start walking in the streets, and someone, Haji Abdul Kader, talked to them, oh, you are Jews? Yes, what are you doing here? We came to visit, we are selling our stuff and we're going to Palestine. Oh, you know that I also went to Palestine, I did pilgrimage to Mecca and then to Palestine, to Haram Sharif. Where are you going? We want to go to Jerusalem. Oh, it's not good. Jerusalem, they have no work. You should go to Haifa. There is harbor. You can find work. Okay, where are you staying? Why don't you stay at my house? Because you know what? These days there were no hotels. You go to uh, another village. You stay wherever you can, either at the Ara Diwan or one of your friends. So they stay for the night. They woke up in the morning. They had two donkeys full of goods. One donkey was stolen. Ooh. They went to look for Haji Adil Abdel Kader. He was already in the field working. What shall we do? This is almost half of their assets, half of their property. They went back to the Mukhtar. Mukhtar is named Amin of Spindare. Say, Mukhtar, our donkey was stolen. Can you help us? And he said, you know, what can I do? People come here from Syria, from Egypt, from Lebanon. How can I help you? I don't know who is here. They went back to Rabatke. In Rabatke, there was someone that I told you was Sheikh Muhammad Rabatke. And they came to him and they told him, he was actually a relative of Sheikh Nuri Barifkani. Any of you know? And uh, they told him, Sheikh, this is a story. We say, why didn't you go to the Mukhtar? And they said, well, we went, but he, this is what he told our people come from Egypt, from Lebanon, from Syria, I can't help you. Now, Sheikh Muhammad Rabatke didn't know how to write. He was illiterate. He called his son, Jafar, come. Say, Jafar, please write. Mukhtar Amin, your name will be obliterated if the donkey of our Jews will not be returned. I don't care if people from Egypt, from Syria, from Lebanon stole it. You have to be responsible to our Jews. This was Thursday. Friday evening, 
they sit in their house and all of a sudden they see a donkey with the goods coming to Rabatka slowly, slowly. Somebody brought him to the border of the village and sent him away. So the Kurds felt, the Jews felt that they, they could trust their Ara, their Muqtars, at times of need. Another time, the Jews had a sheep, which the father of this Moshe brought to, to, to prepare him for sacrifice during the, one of the holidays. And he sent him with the herd of the shepherd, of the shivan of the village, and the sheep didn't come back. And he went, they went to Sheikh Muhammad Rabat, he said, Sheikh, our sheep, the only sheep in the whole Herd did not come back, our sheep. And he said, did you find out? Did you talk? Yes. Did any wolf came or anything? No. So, don't worry, Sheikh Muhammad Rabatke told them, I will find it. Don't worry. He had informers, everybody appreciated and respected Sheikh Muhammad. And he asked his people, but he didn't find anything. He didn't find anything. One day, the two wives of this thief, one named Hussein, one named Suleiman, the two wives were arguing. And one tell to another, you know, if the sheikh will find out that it's, we stole the sheep of the Jews, what he will do to us? In between those thieves, there was a name a Kurdish woman named Aisha. She heard it. She heard it. She went to the water to, to bring some water and then she went back to the house of Moshe and she stood in front of the door and she says, O oh door, O oh door, you know, these are the thieves of your ship, Hussein and Suleiman. And she went away. And the next morning, the mother of this Moshe is going also to bring water, and she met Halime Khatun, the wife of Sheikh Muhammad Rabatke. And they talk like women talk when they go to bring water. She say, uh, what is going on with your ship? He said, well, we know who stole it. How do you know? An angel told us an angel. So Halim Khatun goes home and she talks to her husband. He says, Sheikh Muhammad, how do you want the Jews to be here if you can't keep their property? He said, how do you know? I heard angels told me. He calls his servant, his Olam, and he tells him, go and call Hussein. Bring him in the middle of the night, bring him here. If he is dressed, undressed, bring him here. Hussein comes within five minutes and Sheikh Muhammad Rabatke asks him, tell me one question. You can ask her, he answer, truly or not truly? Did you steal the sheep of the Jews? He said, yes. He said, fine, go home. He went home. After one week, he had patience. He was smart. He called Suleiman. He said, Suleiman, how are you? Did you steal the sheep of the Jews? He said, yes. Okay, go away. After one week, he called them. He said, listen, I want you within one week to leave your house, to leave your property, and go away. I don't want anybody who steal the property of Jews to live here. If you will not leave, I will burn you in your house. Aman, Dakhil, what can you do? They went to the Mukhtar. On top of the sheikh, there was Mukhtar of this, uh, of this village. And uh, Ali, Ali bin Khader. And they asked him, please help us. One day they went to the house of Sheikh Muhammad. They put a rope around their neck. When they went to the house of Sheikh Muhammad Rabatke, as soon as they opened the door, they need on four. 
And Sheikh Muhammad said, take these dogs out. They humiliated themselves in order to seek mercy. In the end, he forgave them. But he asked them to pay, to give for each leg of a sheep, four sheep, each one of them. The next morning, the Jewish people, family, found eight sheep tied near their courtyard. So, my book, my research, contained hundreds of stories about it, some of them about Arabs who were not so nice, who were coveted, who exploited the Jews, who took advantage of the Jews economically, physically, and other ways. But in this occasion, I wanted to emphasize the good values, the good memories that Jewish people had from Kurdistan. And uh, I wanted to share it with you. <clears throat> Another stories or group of stories relate to Mullah Mustafa. You know, Mullah Mustafa Barzani was a chieftain of the Barzani tribes, but he, he controlled also Accra. And Accra had Jewish families named Khawaja Khino. They were very rich. And for two or three generations, the Barzani chieftains and the family of Khawaja Khino cooperated. And Mullah Mustafa Barzani had a friend named Dahud Khawaja Khino. And he always asked help and supported him, and vice versa, it was mutual friendship. In 1945, 44, the patriarch of the family deceased, Fawaja Khino, and Mullah Mustafa came to pay condolences. He didn't go to the sheikhs of Accra. First, he went to the Jewish house. And the Jews and the sheikhs, there were respectable sheikhs in Accra, they were surprised. If someone, a big, big tribal chieftain like Mullah Mustafa comes to the area, he first has to visit the, the, the most respected people, right? Only then the Jews who are subject, who are protégés, even though they are rich and prosper. So he went to them and uh, he was living to, towards Iran, towards the uh, beginning of the war from there. And he took, after saying goodbye, farewell, he went outside, distanced himself from the people, and he talked to the two Khawajahino brothers, Dahud and Eliyahu, and he told them, you know, uh, the Zebari Aras suggested that I will marry the sister of uh, Kader Ara and uh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad, uh, Zebari suggested that I'll marry his, that, uh, uh, I'll marry his sisters. So he was consulting them. So Dawood Khawaja Khino told him, I think that you should marry the daughter of Muhammad Ara, and maybe Sheikh Ahmed should marry the sister of Kader Ara. He said, okay, in that case, prepare us some gold for the engagement. So he didn't have gold ready, but he took from his wife half kilo of gold, Two, two, two daughters, and he gave it, so they sent it to the Zebari. This was the pact that made Barazani into the most important tribe in the region. Forty years passed, and the Israeli Mossad is beginning to initiate 30 years contact with Mullah Mustafa Barzani. And he said, you know, I have a friend in Israel, Dawood Khawad Jachino. Try to find out details about him. Well, the Mossad, it's a Mossad, you know, it's not something uh, likely taken. They go and find out, they find nothing. There's no Dawood Khawaja Khino, because they changed their name into Gabai, the collector. You know, in the end they found someone in Tiberius. And they took a picture, they went, they took a picture from him, and the next meeting was Mullah Mustafa, they came. Oh, Mullah Mustafa is your friend. He looks at the picture, he said, no, this is not my friend. Dawood Khawaja Khino was always wearing Shale Shapek in the best of the way clothes. He has, he was 
He closed us like a grocery person because he worked in the grocery. What did you do from Khawaja uh, Khino? He was the most influential, rich person in Accra. I don't want to make business with you, with this kind of country. So, the people of the, this organization went back to Tiberius, and this time they recorded Dawud Khawaja Akhino, and he was talking to Mullah Mustafa, they brought the recording to, to him, and it was very important in the building up the relations between these people. When Mullah Mustafa came to Israel twice, he visited Dawud Khawaja Akhino in his house, and uh, exchanging gifts, and he actually brought back gold that he was given years ago to give to Salima, one of the daughters, whose jewelry was taken for his engagement. 